Hello and welcome to part two of my Scott Guy deep dive story. I'm not going to muck around for too long. We'll get straight into it because I know you've all been patiently waiting. Um, but thank you for your patience. Thank you for uh, being okay with me breaking this into two parts. I had best of intentions to record everything all in one go last week. But honestly, after about four hours, my voice just gave up the ghost. Yeah, so I guess the universe was telling me to shut up. Anyway, that's fine. Today we are back. We're picking up where we left off. If you haven't seen the first part, I highly suggest you go back and watch it. But just quick recap, we are talking about the murder of fielding farmer Scott Guy in 2010. And leading up to his murder, he and his wife Kylie had experienced a series of quite violent vandalisms. He'd had a lot of conflict with his brother-in-law Ewan. And six months after Scott's murder, it seemed like the police had absolutely nothing. There was no leads that seemed promising. And then they dropped a bombshell and they arrested Scott's brother-in-law, Ewan McDonald, who was married to Scott's sister, Anna Guy, and had four children with her. So today, the last thing we talked about was Ewan had just been arrested and his lawyer, Greg King, had assisted him on his way to his first court hearing. Quickly, before we go ahead and get into it, thank you for being here. If you like this video and you'd like to see more like that, then go ahead and subscribe if you'd like to. Otherwise, if you're interested in seeing more frequent content, you can head over and check out what I do on TikTok. I'm usually a bit more frequent over there in terms of posting and the style of content I share there is usually much less scripted and much shorter. So if you're into that, then go ahead and check it out. Otherwise, let's go ahead and get into the rest of the story. So right from day one, the defense, Ewan's defense, were up against roadblocks and totally on the back foot. Ewan's defense team were going up against a seemingly unwinnable case. This inequality was an issue that had long irked Greg King. He was became Ewan's defense lawyer. He was a very, very high profile defense lawyer in New Zealand at the time. He defended some very prolific people, such as Clayton Weatherston, who we talked about in the video on Sophie Elliott, Scott Watson, who was convicted of the killings of Ben Smart and Olivia Hope in the Sounds murders, quote unquote murders, and other big names, just to name a few. And he'd come up against the struggle of inequality many, many times in his career as a defense lawyer. Adding to this challenge is that in the lead up to Ewan's trial, leader of the defense side, Greg King, was actually due to be out of the country. And he wouldn't be returning until little over two weeks before the trial was due to start. So in order for the defense to continue tracking along and do their job to build an adequate defense for Ewan, Peter Coles held down the fort in Greg's absence and he did an absolutely phenomenal job of pulling together a very robust defense under less than ideal conditions. The defense also decided to hire former detective turned private investigator Paul Bass to assist with their case. Now, as if Greg King being out of the country wasn't enough of a challenge, the police and prosecution seemed hell bent on making the process as difficult as possible for the defense, to the point of appearing as though they were intentionally trying to hamper the process of a fair trial. They seemed to withhold discovery for as long as possible, and then when they would eventually hand it over, as they're required to do by law, they made it virtually impossible for the defense to actually use it. And in fact, this process of being handed the discovery was so challenging that Greg King actually threatened to file for an adjournment of the trial date due to these setbacks because it became almost 
laughable. Paul Bass believes that if it wasn't intentionally obstructive, the police and the Crown, their actions were completely unprofessional. And these difficulties obtaining discovery and information from the police continued even into the trial. The most glaring instance of police withholding information perhaps is when the defence got wind that the police had bugged Ewan McDonald's phone. In order for police to be able to do this, to bug somebody's phone, they have to get a warrant from a judge and it is an absolutely crucial part of any inquiry that must be disclosed by police. Peter Coles was incredulous that this information hadn't been made available to them and actually hardly believed that it could be true because it was just so unthinkable that they wouldn't reveal this to the defense. It turns out Ewan's phone had been bugged more than a year before, eight days prior to his arrest. And police claim that no relevant information was gathered. And while this may not have helped their case, the fact that Ewan hadn't said a single incriminating thing throughout this entire process was potentially of great significance to the defense. Now, as the trial date loomed nearer and Greg King arrived back in the country, he knew that despite all the hurdles they'd had to overcome with police and the prosecution, the biggest difficulty would actually be in convincing the jury to look past the other crimes that Ewan had committed and confessed to. Now, prior to the trial, the court ruled in favor of the defense, and actually the prosecution sort of supported this too, in omitting certain acts of the vandalism from evidence, believing that it would be far too prejudicial. This included the killing of the 19 calves, the dumping of the milk vat, and the burning down of the fare on sextons, and also it's because they weren't really relevant to the guy case. So the defense had also won their plea for a change in location for the trial. And this was in part due to the revelation of what some of the rumors were that were circulating around town. And you guys, these are so insane, like bananas. So I'm not going to dwell on them, but just to give you an example of the lunacy that people were saying There was one rumor that Scott and Ewan were actually in a gay relationship and Ewan killed Scott because he refused to leave Kylie, which is just completely bananas. So let's just move on from that. Now, Greg King stressed that right from the first time he met Ewan, Ewan openly admitted to the vandalism crimes, but insisted he did not kill Scott. Greg King never asked Ewan if he actually did it, and he never regretted taking on the case despite the hurdles. Quote, no, Ewan's a good man, and I wanted to be there with him during this trial. He's not a Mona. He's not a whinger. He's polite. I've never heard him swear, which is unusual in this business. He's a perfect gentleman to be with. I like him a lot and I feel privileged he's put his faith and trust and literally his life in my hands. But that also means a huge amount of responsibility. And the fact he's a nice guy increases the pressure. It's much easier to do this job when you don't like your client. And obviously we've dwelt long and hard on why the hell did he involve himself in burning this guy's house down, etc. And what were the circumstances and what madness possessed him to do that? And I guess he never thought of the consequences. They were spontaneous acts that they're both very ashamed of. We're not trying to dress it up. We can't. It's horrendous. But our point is, that doesn't make him a murderer. And then on June 5th, 2012, nearly two years to the day since Scott's murder, Ewan McDonald's trial finally began. Coincidentally, it was also his 32nd birthday, but he would not be sitting down to candles and cake this year. Hours before proceedings were due to start, cameras and reporters lined the streets outside the courtroom waiting, waiting for 
the public gallery to open. Inside the foyer, reporters formed a huddle outside courtroom one, waiting for the doors to open so they could take a position on the media benches. Greg King strode into court to defend McDonald. Long robe, sharp shoes, short hair, feeling as prepared as he ever had for a trial. But despite the powerhouse team that assembled, despite the months of work, King was pretty realistic about the challenge that they faced ahead of them. Quote, Statistically, what are the chances of getting someone off a murder charge in New Zealand nowadays? Not many people do. The jury sees the amount of work the police have put into it, and there's this natural comfort to thinking they must have got it right. And it's really, really hard to overcome that. But I think we can answer their case. I think we can address the evidence. And there are many lines of inquiry that actually point away from our client as being the murderer. It's a total murder mystery. And the question is whether the police have solved it. So over the course of four weeks, the jury heard about 100 hours of evidence and argument. The case, which had already attracted an astonishing level of public attention, seemed to transfix the nation. Reports of the day's proceedings were always the top story on every news site, every news channel, every newspaper. Crowds queued up to get a seat in the public gallery. Elderly women ran for the doors as they opened. Security guards were forced to ask people to stand back and diehard fans would line up for hours before the proceedings. And it was in this courtroom, courtroom one, that the case against Ewan McDonald and all its holes and flaws and inconsistencies was finally laid bare for the nation to see. At 10.35 a.m., lead prosecutor Ben van der Kolk rose from the bench to deliver the Crown's opening statement. Van der Kolk told the jury of the prior vandalisms and attacks on Scott and Kylie by Ewan. He linked it to the graffiti, to the threatening notes that had appeared in Scott and Kylie's letterbox around the time of the crimes. He walked the jury through the rising tensions in the weeks, months, and years leading up to Scott's death. He spoke to the motive. Feeling resentful at Scott's laziness and sense of entitlement about the farm, worried about his future, Ewan believed the only solution was to murder the man who'd been his best man at his wedding. Ben van der Kolk posited that on early July 8th, Ewan McDonald biked the 1.5 kilometers between his house and Scott's driveway, closed the gates and waited until Scott arrived on his way to work. At 4.43 a.m., he killed Scott with the farm shotgun when Scott got out of his ute to open the gate. At some stage, police claimed, Ewan McDonald stole three Labrador puppies Scott and Kylie were raising from a shed near their house to make it look like a burglary gone wrong. McDonald then biked back home, hid anything incriminating, cleaned himself up and walked to the nearby farm workshop to unlock it at 5.02 a.m. and begin the day's work. He then went on to explain how the farm's shotgun was stored in the office, which was just behind you and McDonald's house, and that it could not be excluded as the murder weapon because it hadn't been locked away. Most compellingly, Van der Kolk told the jury of the very distinctive footprints around the crime scene, which matched a pair of pro-line dive boots that had not just been sold in Manawatu, but sold in the Palmerston North hunting and fishing store owned by Ewan's father, Kerry. The prosecution claimed that Ewan had owned a pair exactly like this at least six years prior to Scott's murder. For the jury and reporters, this opening statement, particularly the information about the dive boots, seemed explosive. Adding to this, Scott and Kylie and the Guy family never knew that that it was actually their brother-in-law, Ewan, who had destroyed their property. So for this to come out in court, it was a horrible, horrible shock to the Guy family and one that just added insult to injury, particularly to Anna, who was already suffering the loss of her brother and now her husband and also now had to come to terms with the fact that the man she married and had four children with was not at all the man she thought he was. They all knew that Scott and Ewan had their disagreements, but they never, ever, ever imagined that there could be so much 
deep-seated hatred at play. All of this coming out meant that the relationship between Ewan and the Guy family, and even Anna and his children, was truly, truly beyond repair. No matter the outcome of the trial, there was no way that they could come back from this. They could not come back from knowing what he had done to Scott and Kylie and quite happily kept secret and gotten away with. After this, many people felt that the defense was dead to rights and could not see a way that Greg King could possibly salvage this. It seemed that this case was pretty much already done, but many people had never experienced Greg King in action. There is a reason that he was the most prominent and prolific almost celebrity defense lawyer in the country. So where Ben Vanderkolt's opening statement took over two hours, Greg King's less than five minutes, quote, this case is a proverbial whodunit. King stressed that it was up to them, the jury, to decide if the Crown had solved the mystery, but that it wasn't their job to try and solve it themselves. He touched quickly on the horrible, horrible crimes committed by Ewan. He knew he couldn't avoid it, so acknowledgement, apology, and contrition was really the only way to go. He then handed each juror a piece of paper which had two times written on it. One time read 4.41 a.m. when police said that Scott Guy made his last keyboard stroke finished his coffee before heading out the door to work. And the other time was 5.02.51, which was the time that Ewan McDonald deactivated the alarm on the farm workshop behind his house more than 1.5 kilometers away from where Scott was killed. Greg King stressed that timing was crucial in this trial. And he invited the jury to fill the gap between these two definite and provable times with key events and issues that were to be raised. Greg King's opening statement was entirely designed to reinforce to the jury that trials are about evidence and facts and logic and not about emotion and prejudice or trying to bring peace to a family. Now, throughout the course of the trial, Greg King called very, very few witnesses for the defense, which was a surprise to some. But Greg explained his approach, saying that it was not the defense's job to prove innocence. But Greg King explained his approach, saying that the defense's job is to poke holes in the prosecution's argument and that he didn't need witnesses to do that. And poke holes he did. Detective Inspector Sue Schwalger insisted that no stone had been left unturned and every piece of evidence had been thoroughly examined throughout the course of the investigation. But throughout the trial, there were examples of mistakes that, while seemingly small, kept building an increasingly large picture of sloppiness and incompetence. Many examples of this were called out around the most crucial matter at the center of this case. Was it actually possible for Ewan McDonald to kill Scott Guy? The police and prosecution argued that Ewan McDonald had from 4.43 a.m. to 5.02 a.m. to commit the crime. Those 19 minutes affording him ample time to kill Scott and cover his tracks. But it was never that simple. So let's just rewind the clock a little bit and think back to that morning. After Scott Guy got up that morning, he took his wedding ring off, made a coffee and checked his computer. His last keystroke was at 4.41 a.m. Nobody knows what he did after that. Did he finish his coffee? Did he go to the toilet? Did he have a smoke? Did he fiddle with his iPod in his ute or whatever? Nobody knows. At the very earliest, Scott would have arrived at the gates at 4.43 a.m. That's at best. Scott was due to start work at 4.50 a.m. that morning at the workshop behind McDonald's house, which was 1.5 kilometers away. This would have taken him about a minute to drive in his ute. So if he did arrive at the gates at 4.43 a.m., he would have arrived to work unusually early. And we know that Scott was not known for his punctuality <laughs> at work. He was chronically late. So it would have been odd for him to have arrived before his start time. 
actually alone at his start time. So it actually could have been later that he arrived at the gates at the bottom of his driveway. Ewan McDonald was due to start work at 5am that day, just 10 minutes after Scott. So if Ewan did kill Scott, he had to be sure that he would have enough time to commit the murder, cover it up, make his way back to the shed, all without being seen in, at best, generously, a 19-minute window. If Ewan was late and he didn't make it back by this time, he would have been spotted by one of the other farm workers who could have reported his lateness to the police, thereby immediately drawing suspicion towards himself. Ewan couldn't control when Scott left the house, and he would have expected him to leave in his ute to head to work at the very best 4.48 in the morning. So that would have given him only... 11 minutes, 10, 11 minutes to carry out the murders, which is even more unrealistic. Within that window, 10 to 19 minutes, Ewan would have had to do the following. Walk over to Scott and check that he was dead. The killer's footprints were found beside Scott's body, so we know that he did this. Collect the shotgun shells, which, by the way, were never found. Retrieve his bike. No bike tracks were ever found anywhere also, by the way, but this is what the prosecution claimed he used. Dispose of the puppies if he hadn't done so already and the shotgun shells. No sign of the puppies ever to this day. Nobody knows what happened to them. Return the bike to his garage without leaving any traces of mud or water. And it had been raining, so it would have been noticed. Clean the gun and break it into three parts, storing them separately in the adjoining farm office. Check he didn't have any telltale marks on himself, which he could have because Scott was shot at close range with a shotgun. Probably would have had some blood spatter on him. Get rid of his clothes, particularly his boots, and change into his milking gear. All of this by just after 5am when he was seen leaving his house blurry-eyed like he'd just gotten out of bed and retrieving the farm workshop key, unlocking the door and disabling the alarm at 5.02 a.m. What's that? What's the, uh, is it Occam's razor? Yeah. Do we think really that, that that's realistic? Even if he did manage to cycle back, even if he did, he would have had to do it with a shotgun that didn't have a carry, a holster, and three puppies under his arm on his bike, in the rain, in the mud. So, yeah. There was one more complication to the police theory of that 19-minute window, and that was farm worker Matthew Ireland. The exact time that Matthew Ireland arrived at the shed behind McDonald's house is impossible to pinpoint, but he was likely there between 4.40 a.m. and 4.50 a.m. Ireland had gotten in Scott's bad books the week prior and so he'd been arriving to work early every day to try and make it up to Scott and press him and fall back in his favor. So he was there early that day expecting Scott to be the one to open the shop at 4.50 and he saw, he had a clear line of sight to McDonald's house and the shed, he saw Ewan leaving his house at 5 a.m. to head to the shed that morning looking like a person who's just woken up at 5 a.m. not hurriedly returned back from a murderous mission. It is very unlikely that Ewan McDonald could have snuck back in after killing Scott Guy, stashed his bike, his gun, his clothes, without tripping a security light or Matthew Ireland noticing him. So even if Matthew Ireland's arrival is at the extreme end of estimates, 4.50 a.m., and Scott Guy's murder occurs at the earliest time possible of 4.43 a.m., then the 19 minutes police claimed McDonald had to carry out the murder suddenly shrinks to just seven. Because remember, he couldn't arrive after Matthew Ireland has shown up to sit waiting. He had to have done it before Matthew Ireland arrived for work that morning, otherwise he would have been seen. There's no possible way he could have snuck back unnoticed. And look, in any scenario involving Ewan McDonald as the killer, every minute matters. It is crucial to the case whether or not this could have happened as the prosecution 
alleges. Prosecutor Ben Vanderkolk counters this argument, saying that McDonald could have hidden everything he used to carry out the murder and dealt with it later that day. But Scott's father, Brian Guy, checked the farm shotgun almost immediately after he reached the farm office that morning and found it exactly as he had left it. Moreover, Ewan McDonald was with family and farm workers all day the day of Scott's murder, which meant he wouldn't have had an opportunity to so adequately clean up after himself that police have never been able to find a single trace of evidence. Mike White, who is the incredible investigative reporter where I sourced most of the information on this case, he says it's also extremely important to consider the risks that you and McDonald needed to take in order to carry out this plan that the prosecution alleges. So Anna Guy could have noticed Ewan getting up much earlier than usual that day. They had a bunch of kids. Any one of them could have woken. Anna is a very, very light sleeper. She said so herself. After having children, she wakes up to the sound of anything. So it's entirely likely she would have woken. Kylie could have heard the shots immediately and peeked out the curtain or the blinds and caught Ewan in the act or immediately phoned the police who could have intercepted Ewan on his mad bike ride back to the shed. Matthew Ireland could have seen Ewan McDonald cycling back on the bike with the shotgun and the three puppies. There were 10 houses between Scott's driveway and the farm shed. Any one of those, the residents could have seen or heard Ewan as he raced back home, especially if there's you know, what do they call them? Security lights are along the way that he could have tripped. Anybody driving along Ayarangi Road that morning could have spotted Ewan. And there were people driving along Ayarangi Road that morning. Crucially, Matthew Ireland clearly remembers a car coming from the direction of Scott Guy's house as he arrived at work that morning, almost exactly at the time that police suggest Scott was murdered. Matthew Ireland also recalled another car coming from the same direction as they made their way to the milking shed that morning. Neither car has ever been identified. Neither car. Liam Collins, the novice lawyer on the defense team, spent months trawling through those 40,000 pages of evidence, trying to come up with a credible timeline that could have put McDonald in the frame. Quote, to this day, I have no idea how they actually think he did it second by second. What time did he get up? How did he avoid Anna waking up? What time did he get up there? Did he kill the puppies before or after? Why would he cycle back along the main road? Why weren't there any bike tracks? Tell me how he could do it. Liam Collins says the time frame is just so tight that it's actually unrealistic. Quote, Ewan McDonald plays forward in his rugby team. He's not Lance Armstrong on a push bike. And for Peter Coles, the other of the defense lawyers, he said that the cars that Matthew Ireland saw remain utterly critical and completely unresolved, the fact that they've never been identified. Quote, the only way you'd be on that road is if you knew of its existence and had some reason to be there. It's not State Highway 1. The failure to find either of those cars, despite it being publicized throughout New Zealand, just defies belief. Unless that car is connected with the murder, in which case it can't be you and McDonald. Now, if you had to pinpoint a moment that the trial truly turned on its head, it would be the afternoon of day seven when Anna Guy testified and was cross-examined by Greg King. The Crown had made quite a bit of fuss about the shoe prints that they had taken castings of at the scene. And police believed that they belonged to a pair of pro-line dive boots, which they said Ewan owned, although they'd never been found. Greg King asked Anna when she last remembered seeing the boots. And she said it was in 2008 when they were shifting house. She said that one tatty boot had been used to store their spare house key. And as they packed up everything, she told Ewan they weren't taking it with them and recalled throwing it in the trash. Surprisingly, few media outlets picked up on the significance of what Anna had just said despite the boots being literally the only forensic link that they had between you and McDonald and the murder. That was it. 
and they didn't even have his boots. This was the only link. If the boot had been thrown out, as Anna said it did, there was no way that Ewan could have been wearing them and be responsible for the imprints found at the crime scene. Greg King took a gamble asking Anna about that. He'd been barred from interviewing her prior to the trial and actually had no idea how she might answer his question. But Ewan had told him that that's what had happened to the boots. But Greg King couldn't guarantee that Anna would confirm this and corroborate the story. She possibly didn't even realize the significance of what she just said. And as it turns out, the Crown was totally blindsided at that moment, despite police interviewing Anna, her throwing out the boot in question, for some reason, had never been raised. Remember all those mistakes and building, growing picture of incompetency we mentioned earlier? Anyway, the next day, away from court and unbeknownst to the jury, Anna was taken back for questioning by police who felt their entire case was at risk of being blown out of the water, and rightfully so. Though Anna later eventually admitted she couldn't remember actually specifically throwing the boot in the trash, she did still stick by her story, which provided enormous doubt to the Crown case. And honestly, power to you, Anna, because that's the point of a trial, is to uncover the truth. And what a bind Anna Guy must have been in in this whole situation where her husband and the father of her children is on trial for the murder of her brother. Disgusting. I just can't imagine. Moreover, in addition to kicking a giant hole in the prosecution's case, Anna actually confirmed that life with Ewan in, in, in the 18 months prior to Scott's death had never been better. He was spending more time at home. He was hanging out with the kids. He wasn't even moaning about Scott. He just seemed really happy. That even just got him back from an idyllic holiday in Fiji. And Anna said that they were in a really good space. When she said this, Ewan started sobbing. Well, I don't know why he threw it all away with those vandalisms and attacks. Why would you do that, mate? There was one more crucial blow to the whole dive boot thing that Greg King had up his sleeve, just to further undermine it all, because he's such a pro. Despite the forensic scientist David Neal suggesting that the impressions had to have been made by a boot size 9 or 10, Greg King asked him to count how many rows of the wavy lines on the forefoot of the boot sole had been left in several scene imprints. And Neil told him it was 32 to 33. And then Greg King asked him to count the number of lines on the size nine boot that they had as an example exhibit in the courtroom. There were 29. Could that Proline boot that's been produced as an exhibit size nine have made an impression leaving 32 to 33 rows of waves in the forefoot area? No, it could not. King says by his count, the boots were size 11 or 12. Greg King then suggested an adjournment, which I'm sure the prosecution was quite grateful for. It is, again, it just points to the sloppiness of the Crown and the prosecution and the police investigation. Like, something as small as that. Ugh. It was just another damning blow that continued to erode the Crown case. Now, the dive boots were not, in fact, the only glaring example of sloppiness on behalf of the Crown case. Right from the very first witness, there were inconsistencies. When the officer in charge of the exhibits, Constable Fraser McKenzie, admitted there were errors in documents about what had happened to a shotgun and ammunition police seized. Times given by a police officer on the scene, Senior Constable Neil Martin, didn't correlate with evidence from other officers and phone records. And actually, it seemed completely inaccurate. When police digital analyst Anthony Drake was cross-examined, he seemed confused over when Scott Guy's computer was last used. 
having to readjust his timing. Drake also admitted that only that morning he had to recheck his findings and now accepted Guy also visited Hotmail just before he left for work and was shot. His initial evidence never included this, despite police having had two years to confirm it. It just got worse for poor Anthony when a computer savvy juror sent a note to the judge suggesting an explanation for the confusion over computer timing. That's bad. That's bad. When a juror outsmarts the crown expert on a particular matter. There was also, of course, the delay in finding the second shotgun wad and questions over how it got there when it was found. But one of the most blatant failures by police concerned a key witness, Derek Sharp. On the morning of the murder, Sharp was woken by two loud bangs, which he thought to be from a shotgun. He was one of four neighbors who were either woken by or heard shots around the time that Scott was thought to have been killed. Derek Sharp said he looked at his clock and it read 5 a.m., but he said he knows his clock to run 15 minutes fast. He explained to the court how his clock continually gained time due to being near transmission lines. And when he would intermittently re reset it, he would use his wristwatch, which was also fast. But Derek Sharp claimed he knew roughly how fast everything was because every now and then he would compare it to radio time pips. His evidence was extremely hard for the court to take seriously, with even Judge France appearing to be visibly amused. But there was one thing that seriously overshadowed this comedy and confusion, which was something that the police had obviously overlooked or just omitted to do. While numerous other phones, wristwatches, clocks were checked for accuracy against a world clock, Derek Sharp's bedside clock never was. Even though his reading of the time was one of the only ones that could actually pinpoint the time that Scott Guy was killed. Even worse, the police didn't even test to confirm if it was even a thing that his clocks could gain time from being near transmission lines. And so the defense decided to do it. And they brought in a, an expert to test the high tension wires to see if they could actually make Sharp's clocks run as fast as he claimed. They couldn't. It was bullshit, basically. And look, everybody else, those other neighbors who woke or heard shots, they all claim that the shots occurred at 5 a.m., which tracks with Scott being chronically late. If this is true, and if the police had actually bothered to check Derek Sharp's bedside clock, we wouldn't even be here, then it would not have been possible for Ewan McDonald to do it because he was spotted by Matthew Ireland walking out of his house at 5.02 that morning. Derek Sharp's statement was the only one that put the killings at around 5.45 a.m., which is the time police argued Ewan McDonald killed Scott. This guy, with his very eccentric way of measuring time, was the only guy, the only one, and that's what they hanged their hat on. A simple police check would have quickly established if Ewan did it or not. A single police check is all it would have taken, and they would have realized it was impossible or it was, but they never did it. For Greg King, this oversight was inexplicable, given how it could have added crucial certainty to the police case. The next issue that the prosecution raised is the matter of the bike, the bike that Ewan supposedly used to cycle there and cycle back under cover of darkness. Now, the bike was normally kept in a garage behind Ewan's house. Ewan could have left it out the night before, but that raised the possibility of Anna or the kids spotting it, or a visitor, or a person driving by. Or if he decided to risk leaving it in the shed, he would have had to lift the very loud and rusty steel roller door to get it out. So would he have made that risk knowing that Anna was a light sleeper? He also couldn't rule out 
people driving by him or neighbours spotting him as he rode down Ayarangi Road towards Scott's house. And even if the cars that Matthew Ireland noticed weren't involved in the crime, they would have seen Ewan McDonald. So would he really have risked that, knowing that people could watch it happen? So even with the best of planning, what was Ewan going to do if he's riding down the road and a car drives past? Is he just going to hide in a verge or a ditch? That cuts into the time even more. The crown theory that McDonald used a push bike to travel to and from the guy's property was only formed on the basis that Ewan had said that previously in their night missions, he and Callum Bo would use push bikes because they were quiet and easy to hide. This must have been very helpful for the Crown. But despite the scene being combed by investigators and forensic experts, no bike tracks or evidence of a bike being there were ever found. Not only that, but it had been raining, so it would have been obvious if there were any bike tracks or tire marks and none were found and again remember how we said that he would have had to then return back to his house with a shotgun that didn't have a shoulder holster and three puppies under his arm in record time now of course he could have stolen the puppies and disposed of them any time earlier than the last time Scott Guy fed them the night before at 6 p.m. Although the police believe they were stolen just before the murder, this would have meant that Ewan would have had to get up even earlier and increased the chance of Anna noticing his absence or hearing him get up extremely early on a day that he wasn't due to open the shop. And then let's just say he did dispose of the puppies earlier or whatever, and he's riding back along Ayarangi Road without them. He still has to somehow get past Matthew Ireland, who would have been sitting waiting in the driveway at that point without being spotted. So how did he stash the bike without it being found or heard? Because he couldn't have rolled up the roller door without Matthew Ireland seeing him. He couldn't have left it along the house because it would have been spotted. And even if he did leave it outside, Anna would have noticed that as well. It would have been odd and out of character. And if he did put it back in the garage, it had been raining, so the bike would have been wet and covered in mud. So it just doesn't make sense. There was no basis to this. This was purely speculation on the prosecution's part. And if you suggest that he didn't use a bike, then he couldn't have gotten to Scott Guy's house and back in the time. There's just no way. He couldn't have taken a quad bike because the farm bikes were stored locked away in the farm shed and entry was recorded by security firm and they weren't taken that day his own vehicle was in the garage to get it out he would have woken Anna and the kids so this is kind of crazy that despite there being a complete and total lack of evidence literally no evidence at all and not even a plausible theory This is still what the police insisted happened. That brings us to the shotgun. Now, Brian Guy testified that the farm shotgun, which was used to scare birds and put down sick cows, was stored in three pieces in the office adjoining the garage behind Ewan McDonald's house. One piece in a cabinet and the other two hidden behind it. He said that nobody else knew where it was and he checked on it the morning of the murder and it was exactly where he'd left it. Ewan McDonald didn't have a shotgun of his own and if he needed one for something like duck shooting, he'd borrow one from his own father. Kerry owned an outdoor store. The Crown argued that the farm shotgun couldn't be ruled out as the murder weapon and this was partly due to it being the only gun that Ewan McDonald could could have realistically used. But let's assume that Ewan did know where the farm shotgun was hidden, which he didn't, but let's say he did. Would he have really used the farm gun to kill Scott Guy? He had no idea that there would be uncertainty in the initial hours of how Scott had been killed once it happened. Any killer would have to assume that police would immediately be on the lookout for any guns in the area. Thus, as soon as he killed Guy, he would have had to wipe the gun clean and place it exactly where Brian Guy left it. Any slip in this and Brian Guy's suspicions would have immediately been raised. So let's just run through that scenario again. 
So when arriving back to his house after killing Scott, having managed to avoid being seen by other traffic and not be noticed by Ireland as he rode up the drive and put the bike away, McDonald still had to stash the gun in the office, also without being spotted by Ireland or the other farm worker, Simon Asplin, who was due to arrive at any time, and he did so just after 5 a.m. Again, to hide the shotgun elsewhere, hoping to sneak it back into the office later, was an impossible risk, given it was fair to expect as happened, that Brian Guy or the police would check on its whereabouts straight after hearing that Scott had been shot. Moreover, nobody noted muddy or bloody footprints on the office carpet and police testing for DNA there produced nothing. One other point about the shotgun, and this I find really interesting. Ewan McDonald was a skilled hunter, but all of his hunting, including the poaching and the killing of Craig Hawkins' trophy stags, had been done with a rifle. Shotguns were used for duck shooting. Now, I learned a thing or two about guns from researching this story because I had no idea. I thought if you wanted to kill someone, you would use a shotgun. But obviously, if you're a skilled hunter, you would know that that is not the most efficient way. So if he was going to use a a shotgun, because that's what he had access to, doesn't really make sense that he would use a lightweight number five duck shooting ammunition, which wouldn't guarantee a kill. If Ewan McDonald, who had access to a better suited weapon, had planned the crime as meticulously as the police and Crown allege, surely he wouldn't have risked it all on the chance that he wouldn't actually kill Scott, who could then possibly identify him to the police as his attacker. So after all of this, on the afternoon of day 18, Greg King entered the courtroom ready to give his closing address to the jury, knowing that this would be his very last chance to convince them that Ewan McDonald had not killed Scott Guy. Greg King gathered himself, turned his lectern to face the jurors, and told them that the case against his client had been constructed by the police and Crown with, quote, the myopic lens of the presumption of guilt. King's closing argument over the following two days brought together all the arguments he'd assembled over the previous year and thousands of hours of work. For nearly four hours, he battered and bruised and dismantled the Crown case, raising his voice occasionally and pausing for effect when needed. It was delivered almost entirely without reference to his notes, which just goes to show how thoroughly he knew and understood this case and believed it. Co-counsel Peter Coles described his closing address as mesmerizing. People said they were watching history in action. And even at the end of his closing address, lead prosecutor Ben van der Kolk came over to Greg King and shook his hand as a sign of respect because even he knew that that was one hell of a performance. The jury deliberated for 10 hours and then at 3.35 p.m. on day 21, Tuesday, July the 3rd, the jurors knocked on the courtroom door to indicate that they had reached a verdict. The jury found the defendant, Ewan McDonald, not guilty. The courtroom just exploded, even though you're not supposed to. A judge warns you before a verdict is read to please stay calm, keep your cool. But even Liam Collins, the youngest lawyer on the defense team, he pumped a fist in happiness, which he said he later regretted because it was a bit distasteful. People were shocked and Poor Ewan's mother just sat there sobbing quietly. Ewan himself was overcome with emotion. Anna McDonald clutched her father's arm. She was in tears and I just cannot imagine the mixed emotions that she must have been feeling. There is no good outcome there, no matter which way you slice it. And then Kylie Guy had an outburst. She screamed, he killed my husband and fled from the courtroom howling. So... It was a very contentious decision. Now, despite winning his case in this trial, Ewan McDonald still had to face the judge at a later date for sentencing over the crimes he had admitted to, which related to the vandalisms and the arson. On September the 14th, 2012, Ewan was sentenced to five years in prison. And incredibly, he actually served his 
full term. He was not let out on parole early, which many people think is very strange given he had no previous criminal convictions. Many wonder if perhaps he was being punished for a crime that some believe he got away with. Because I'm telling you guys, in New Zealand, that is unheard of. There are terrible people, terrible people who do horrible things, who are repeat offenders who get let out on parole after one or two years. Some of them don't even make it to jail. They're just on home detention. So the fact that Ewan served five full years is truly mind-boggling. That is not normal. That's not normal. I'm telling you, I wish our system worked like that because then there'd be a lot of bad eggs who were not recidivist offenders. So after all that, after the trial, Ewan being found not guilty, that just leaves one question on everyone's minds. Ewan didn't do it. Who the hell did? A lot of people had thoughts on the police investigation after the fact. The police themselves said immediately after the verdict that they were not looking for anybody else in connection with this case. So they clearly believe it was Ewan through and through, even though their case is shit. I'm sorry, but it is. You did a bad job. There's, it's actually incredible that it even made it to trial. But anyway, and most New Zealanders who don't really know the ins and outs of the trial, a lot of Kiwis even now still believe that Ewan McDonald did it and was just lucky enough to get away with murder. And tr- honestly, I was kind of one of them. Until I read Mike White's book, Who Killed Scott Guy, I also thought that Ewan McDonald must have done it and that he just got off. But after I learned about it, I read the book and I investigated more. Honestly, I just... I cannot see how he could have done it. It doesn't make sense. Peter Coles is convinced that the police disregarded far more likely suspects. Quote, once they found out about the other crimes he was involved in, I think they just closed the door. And after the trial, police simply shut the book and said the jury got it wrong, we got it right, and that's the end of it. We've got no continuing interest in this. Thus, Coles believes it's unlikely that the case is ever going to be solved. Quote, I just don't think there's any appetite to pursue an alternative outcome. Police do say that the case is still open, but inactive, and there are no staff dedicated to it. Now, investigator and former detective Paul Bass, he said that the police investigation was very poor. Quote, These things work on a timeline, and the timeline never worked for McDonald to be the perpetrator, but they tried to make it work. It's the classic case of making the case fit a suspect as opposed to letting the evidence find you a suspect. The forensic evidence they used to try and place him at the crime didn't fit, and they didn't really have a motive. All the angst between Scott and Ewan had been resolved and they were working well together at the time. The case was all based on the bias of the willful damage and activities with Callum Bow, and that bias continued even after the jury found him not guilty with Sue Schwalger stating outside the court that police weren't actively looking for anybody else. That's the police tunnel vision on display for the rest of New Zealand. Paul Bass is also adamant that the police deliberately tried to hinder McDonald's defense. Quote, anyone with half a brain knows that should be disclosed. And to me, that borders on perverting the course of justice. It's a blatant breach of their duty. Now, Paul Bass, he stresses that he's not anti-police. And actually, he was on the armed offenders squad and commended for his actions during the 1990 Aramoana shootings, which I have also covered in another video, which you can go and check out. So he's legit good former cop. Quote, I'm anti-abuse of power. I'm anti-unprofessional investigations. I was proud to be a detective, but I believe the public deserve a level of professionalism that certainly wasn't on display in this case. Another former detective, Tim McKinnell, he looked into the evidence in this case and he insists that the non-disclosure of such fundamental evidence would not have been a simple oversight. Quote, it's deliberate. You don't forget to do it. You make a conscious decision not to disclose it. And I think it harks back to an archaic attitude that police will determine what's relevant and what's not. And I'm sure it's happening many, many times that we still don't know about. And actually, to this point, I have seen this occur in so many stories 
that we've covered on this channel that I'm actually starting to flesh out the bones of another project, kind of looking into this exact thing because it's truly alarming how often this comes up. I feel pretty strongly on a personal level because in order for our justice system to work, in order for the presumption of innocence to be true, then we need to fight for the neutrality of the police because they're not neutral. They clearly have bias and agendas. So back to Tim McKinnell, a little, you know, tangent from me. Tim McKinnell was actually the investigator who exposed Tina Porter's wrongful conviction. He said he wasn't at all surprised that Ewan McDonald was acquitted. Quote, I was surprised they charged him, and as it played out in court and the prosecution unraveled it, it became clear they didn't have the evidence. They were running on theories that weren't supported by any evidence. And I just found this out too. Apparently on the eve of the trial, Ben Vanderkolk, the lead prosecutor, tried to introduce a jailhouse snitch who claimed that Ewan McDonald confessed to him in prison, which honestly, it is. If you are, if you're trying to introduce a jailhouse snitch, your case is dead in the water, mate. Like that stinks of desperation. And um, fortunately, well, not really that it would have made any difference, but the judge did refuse the snitch's evidence. Almost every time it's proven to be bullshit. It doesn't bolster faith in the police if that's what you're resorting to. Even the other prosecutor, so there was Ben Vanderkolk and Paul Murray, and even Paul Murray admitted that the defense did a very, very good job at unpacking the prosecution's case, but it shouldn't have gone to trial in the first place. It was too weak to begin with. One of Kylie Guy's supporters and long-term friends, Garth McVicker, he's from the Sensible Sentencing Trust, and he said that after the trial, he believed that the police purely succumbed to public pressure and charged McDonald and brought him to trial before they had a strong case. So back to the big question, if not you and McDonald, who actually killed Scott Guy on that bleak winter morning? Oh my God, I'm starting to lose my voice. Luckily, I only have six pages to go. Police had a list of 60 persons of interest. And at trial, the defense suggested that farm worker Simon Asplin had the motive and opportunity to commit the crime. But Peter Coles, who investigated the list of alternative suspects, believes that there was a much more likely line of investigation. And that was of a violent local criminal who was actually out burglarizing the neighborhood that night. The man has name suppression, but it's known that he was involved in a robbery before midnight and what was stolen was swapped for two grams of methamphetamine. He then went out for a long time again after that. His alibi, which was apparently accepted by the police, came from his meth-addled partner who thought he came home at maybe around 4 a.m. but admitted that she was pretty wrecked at the time. The woman herself was a well-known criminal who'd actually been charged with threatening to kill a police officer's family, but she thought he stayed home after that. Then the next day, the man refused to discuss his activities in front of her. Many people told the police that they thought this man was behind it, including somebody who claims to have raided a cannabis operation with him. Quote, that was really full on. If the guy hadn't done what he was told, there were going to be gunshots. He was going hard out. He had two 12-gauge shotguns. He held on to one and D, this other guy, had the other. He has got lots of balls. He's hard out into the meth. He's always on it and gets real aggro. Now, curiously, part of the loot of his robbing activities earlier that night included a packet of Winfield gold cigarettes. Apparently, I don't know much about them, but they were kind of limited edition or not super popular at the time. And an empty packet of these with a distinctive sticker showing it had been available only since June 21, 2010, was found near Scott Guy's driveway, along with the mystery car tire tracks that were never found. Quote, given who he was and what he was out doing that night and what he did the next day, I mean, that's just alarm bells sort of stuff said Peter Coles. Police have always insisted that this man had nothing to do with Scott Guy's murder, but they've actually provided no real reason or evidence as to why, aside from his crack adult partner's claims, and why they ruled him out apart from claiming that the theory of a burglary gone wrong wasn't the case. Their logic 
with regards to this particular person has continued to be questioned. They also still won't answer whether or not they still stand by their decision to charge you in McDonald. Prosecutor Ben Vanderkolk won't even say if he saw the investigation file before McDonald was charged or gave advice on whether there was sufficient evidence. But they do admit, police do admit, that they've not reviewed the entire investigation file since you and McDonald's acquittal. Tim McKinnell says it seems regular practice by police after such cases to, quote, not do much, and it's not good enough. It's not good enough in respect of victims and their whanau. They have an ongoing duty with an unsolved homicide to do all they can to solve it, and the Scott Guy case is no different. So after the trial, the suppression orders on all of the other crimes that Ewan had committed, which included killing the bobby calves and dumping of the milk vat, that lifted. So the revelations shocked the nation and just added insult to injury to the poor Guy family who'd already been through the bloody ringer. And sadly, the tragedy for the Guy family just did not stop there. Brian's father died three months later from pancreatic cancer and, according to the family, a broken heart. Ten months after Scott Guy was murdered, their nephew Andy, who lived in Perth, was pushed out of a window of a two-story building and died. Their granddaughter, Elsie, which was Nikki Guy's first child, when she was born, she lived for just two weeks. She had a congenital heart and lung problem. Quote, when Nikki and James got married, as the father of the bride, I tied pink ribbons on the wedding car. A year later, I tied the same ribbons on, onto Elsie's casket. The smallest coffins are the heaviest, said Brian Guy. And then, in a truly shocking turn of events that still honestly boggles my mind today, famed defense lawyer Greg King was found dead by apparent self-inflicted injuries in 2012. What? What the actual? Honestly, many New Zealanders continue to speculate that this tragic turn of events is just more evidence that Ewan McDonald did do the murders and that Greg King helped him get away with it and couldn't live with himself. But that is really not true. It is true that McDonald was not and probably is not a likable guy and that the crimes that he did commit were awful and heinous and senseless but it's a huge jump to go from poaching and vandalism to killing your brother-in-law at close range with a shotgun even 13 years on from the killings the case still intrigues the nation and it's kind of interesting to look back on why that might be. Law professor Chris Gallivan from Mass University says the case was intriguing because it involved, quote, beautiful affluent white people from a small conservative rural background. It was racist. If this was a case of a Maori family who had a dispute with one family member allegedly killing the other, I don't think it would have made the headlines. The Guy case showed the rest of the country their family dynamics are as messed up as anyone else. This is the essence of a good soap opera. It's a family tragedy about the prodigal son who comes back and says he should take over the farm while the person who's been slaving away and is a brilliant farmer feels put out. The Guy family has completely severed contact with Ewan, although they do not believe that he actually murdered Scott. What they learned about Ewan's dark side and the crimes he did commit against their family were just too horrific for them to forgive. Anna split from Ewan and moved to Auckland with their four children. She has a new partner and they have since had two children together. Scott's wife Kylie moved to the Hawke's Bay with their two children. She fought hard to keep her boys out of the public eye. She was a good mum. Very good mum. She also hired a private investigator to pick up and look into Scott's case with fresh eyes. The private investigator actually uncovered a series of mysterious phone calls made to Scott's cell phone the night before he was killed. Kylie handed all this information over to the police in the hopes that they would follow up and make fresh inquiries, although three years have passed and... There has been no updates on this front. In 2015, Ewan McDonald was released on parole and moved to Christchurch. He has since remarried. In 2016, the Guy family sold the family farm that had been in the family for almost 100 years. The succession plan blew up the day that Scott died. And as of recording this, nobody knows 
who really killed Scott Guy or what actually happened that day. Police have made it clear that they're not pursuing this case any further and despite Kylie's best efforts with the private investigator, there's been no breaks in the case. The Scott Guy case remains one of New Zealand's most enduring and notorious unsolved murders. And that, my friends, concludes this mammoth video series and honestly what a wild ride I'm so interested to hear what you think about this case in the comments down below it is so complex and oh my god I feel like I could make two more extremely long videos about it because there are so many little things little details little pieces of information but ultimately the true tragedy is that this family was torn apart and Two children are growing up without their dad and uh, just seems like, you know, the day that Scott was killed, it set this horrifying series of events in motion and it's just terrible, a terrible thing to have happened. Anyway, I can feel my voice leaving the building, so I'm going to wrap things up here. If you are still with me, please leave a black heart in the comments below to let everybody wonder what the hell we're talking about. Let me know that you made it this far. Also, let me know what you think of these giant, you know, deep dive multi-parter cases. If you like them and want me to keep doing them, then let me know in the comments. Otherwise, if you have any case requests, drop them down below too. And thank you so much for being here. I am so grateful for you. Love you guys lots. Christmas is coming and I'm so looking forward to having a beautiful summer break. I hope it doesn't rain and I hope we don't flood like last year. But otherwise, take such good care. I will see you in the next video. Bye.